Ibn Arabi characterizes the cosmos as a sign, symbol, marker, indicator, and representation of God. In all these instances, the connection between them is one of similarity, or tashbi, suggesting that the cosmos is a reflection or shadow of al-haq in a way that surpasses rational comprehension. These terms, sign, symbol, etc., derive from the Quran and are firmly grounded in the Arabic language and human experience of the cosmos. Hi, I'm Anga Arifka. In this video, we'll talk about causality according to Ibn Arabi. If you like what I do, please like, subscribe, and share. This channel is not monetized. You can also help me out monetarily, be it Patreon or PayPal. Thanks for your support. While philosophers and theologians have put forth numerous rational explanations for the relationship between God and the cosmos, Ibn Arabi scrutinizes them critically, particularly if they rely on terminology outside of the Quran or Hadith. Muslim philosophers often refer to God as the cause of the whole cosmos and the whole cosmos as God's effect. This doctrine holds great importance in philosophers' perspective, to the extent that Ibn Arabi sometimes labels them as the companions of the causes or the affirmers of the causes. However, he regards the application of the term cause to God as misguided and erroneous, as cause and effect are intrinsically interdependent. One cannot exist without the other. Consequently, by attributing causality to God, the philosophers imply that the existence of the cosmos is necessary for God, which contradicts the independence of the divine essence that. Therefore, cause and effect operate within the cosmos but not in the relationship between God and the cosmos. God Al-Haq is existent through his own essence for his own essence, unbounded in wujud, not bound by other than himself. He is not caused by anything, nor is he the cause of anything. On the contrary, he is the creator of the effects and the causes, the king, the all-holy who always was. Al-Haq exists through his own essence for his own essence, meaning that the divine reality exists independently and self-sufficiently without relying on anything outside of himself. According to Ibn Arabi, Al-Haq is neither caused by anything nor the cause of anything. Unlike ordinary causes and effects, which are interdependent and connected, Al-Haq stands apart from this causal relationship. Ibn Arabi explains that causes seek their effects and effects seek their causes. But the independent divine reality is not qualified by such seeking. Quote, we do not make him a cause of anything because the cause seeks its effect just as the effect seeks its cause. But the independence is not qualified by seeking. Hence, it is not correct for him to be a cause. Therefore, it is not appropriate or accurate to attribute causality to Al-Haq. Ibn Arabi further rejects the notion of considering Al-Haq as the cause of causes. He argues that this idea is illogical and absurd because causes and effects are equal in terms of existence. Which would. However, the relationship between Al-Haq and the cosmos does not conform to this equality. Quote, the author is he who is not the cause of anything. Hence, the words of those who say, O oh, cause of causes, is absurd. After all, the cause is equal to its effect in wujud, but the situation is not like that. The divine reality transcends the cause-effect dynamic. By asserting that Al-Haq is the creator of effects and causes, Ibn Arabi implies that the divine is the ultimate originator and sustainer of all phenomena in the whole cosmos. Ibn Arabi rejects the idea of assigning causality to Al-Haq emphasizing the transcendent nature of al-haq in relation to the word of causes and effects. Quote, it is not appropriate that al-haq's acts be assigned causes, for there is no cause that makes necessary the engendering of a thing, save the very wujud of the essence and the fact that the entity of the possible thing is a receptacle for the manifestation of wujud. The cosmos is identical with the cause and effect, I do not say that Al-Haq is its cause, 
as is said by some of the considerative thinkers, for that is the utmost ignorance of the affair. Whoever says so does not know who should know who it is that is the existence. You or so and so are the effect of your cause. And God is your creator, so understand. Ibn Arabi employs the concept that cause and effect necessitate each other in existence to support his rejection of the belief that knowing oneself requires prior knowledge of God. Ibn Arabi further explains, quote, Some of the reflective thinkers have held that knowledge of God is the root in knowledge of the self, but this can never be correct for the creature's knowledge of God. This is so only in al haqs knowledge, and here it is a priority and a root in level, not in wujud. Because in wujud, his knowledge of himself is identical with his knowledge of the cosmos. Although knowledge is a root in level, it is not so in wujud. According to Ibn Arabi, in God's knowledge, there is a priority and foundational aspect in terms of hierarchy or level, but not in terms of existence or wujud. In the realm of existence, God's knowledge of himself is inseparable from his knowledge of the cosmos. Therefore, while knowledge may have a hierarchical aspect in terms of level, it doesn't hold the same hierarchical relationship in terms of wujud or existence. Quote, you say a similar thing in the rational consideration of a cause and an effect, even though they are coextensive in wujud and cannot be otherwise. It is known that the level of the cause is prior to the level of its effects in rational conception, but not in existence. Ibn Arabi throws a parallel to the rational consideration of cause and effect, even though they are coextensive in existence and cannot exist independently. He explains that in rational understanding, the level of the cause is perceived as prior to the level of its effect. However, this hierarchical order is a conceptual distinction and does not reflect the order of their existence. Quote, the same is the case with two correlatives inasmuch as they are two correlatives and this is even more complete in what we mean. For each of the two correlatives is a cause and an effect of that through which the correlation abides. Thus, it is a cause of that of which it is the effect and an effect of that of which it is the cause. Thus, as a cause, sonship makes necessary that fatherhood be its effect. And fatherhood as a cause makes necessary that sonship be its effect. But in respect of their entities, there is no cause and no effect. The same principle applies to two correlatives or interconnected entities. Each of the correlatives acts as both a cause and an effect in relation to the other, resulting in a reciprocal relationship. For example, as a cause, sonship necessitates the existence of its effect, fatherhood, and vice versa. However, in terms of their entities or essences, there is no inherent cause-effect relationship. A well-known philosophical dictum attributed to Avicenna states that from the one there can only arise the one. Ibn Arabi often refers to this dictum but generally rejects it. In this context, he interprets it as implying that God is the cause of a single effect which emanates from him and that this emanation then becomes the cause of the whole cosmos. When framed in this manner, it may seem that this emanation is identical to Ibn Arabi's concept of the breath of the All Merciful. He addresses this issue in one of his chapters. Here he takes up the technical term al haq al makhluk bihi, al haq through which creation occurs, which he often equates with the breath of the All Merciful. This term is derived from various verses in the Quran, and Ibn Arabi credits Ibn Barajan of Seville for using it. However, Ibn Arabi argues that some individuals misunderstood this term, considering it to be an existent entity. Quote, Having heard God's word, he created the heavens and the earth through Al-Haq, Bil-Haq, and other similar Quranic verses, they made Al-Haq through which creation occurs an existent entity. By doing so, they committed the sin of shirk, as there cannot be two wujud. Their mistake lay in misinterpreting the pronoun through, B, assuming that God needed this second reality to create the cosmos. However, they failed to grasp that through actually means for the sake of Li. Thus, the term signifies al haq for the sake of which creation occurs. Al haq is the truth, the rightness, or 
God's wisdom in creation. Ibn Arab explains that the same verse negates the existence of any other associated reality, emphasizing that God is exalted above such associations. After clarifying these points, Ibn Arabi summarizes his objections, which primarily revolve around the issue of causality. Quote, they have stipulated al-haq through which creation occurs into meanings. Some of them make this al-haq through which creation occurs identical with the cause of creation. But al-haq's creation cannot be assigned a cause. This is what is correct in itself. So much so that in him, nothing can be rationally conceived of that would require the causation of this creation of his that becomes manifest. On the contrary, his creation of the creatures is a gratuitous favor toward the creatures and a beginning of bounty and he is independent of the world. Others make this al-haq through which creation occurs an existent entity through which God created what is apart from him. These are those who say that nothing proceeds from the one save one and that the procession of this one is the procession of an effect from a cause, a cause that demands that procession. As for this in it is what is in it, it has error. As for me, I say, when God's command comes, the commander is the command, and this is the Tawhid of him who possesses the command. So associate not, for association is a proven wrongdoing, a wrongdoing that all have condemned. Ibn Arabi expresses his rejection of attributing the term cause to God, but in the last he accepts it. However, he acknowledges that the important point is not whether one uses the term or not, but rather whether one maintains proper courtesy towards God. This implies adhering to the boundaries set by God's revealed language and refraining from interpreting God's speech in a manner that contradicts his own words. If God speaks of creation, then it is appropriate for us to speak of creation at least within the context of the Quranic text. As long as we avoid falling into associations or other errors, it is permissible to refer to God as the cause in suitable context. It is worth noting that the form illa in Arabic not only means cause but also infirmity, just as ma'lul denotes not only caused thing or effect but also inform. Therefore, Ibn Arabi states, the root of the cosmos is infirm, so illness clings to it forever. There is no remedy that could rid it of its infirmity. Ibn Arabi takes into account both meanings of these terms and mentions that some individuals among the folk of God prefer using the term condition to avoid the problems in terms of the term cause. According to this perspective, God is viewed as a necessary condition for the existence of the cosmos rather than its cause. Quote, were he a cause, the effect would be coextensive with him in wujud, but it is posterior to him, for the names prior and posterior are affirmed. Were he to demand the wujud of the cosmos because of his essence, none of its newly arrived things would be posterior to him. Where it's correct that nothing proceeds from him save one, the relations and the witnesses would be nullified. Those who assign relations to the procedure, despite its unity, have affirmed relations and properties. The procedure is a non-existent, but the relations are a non-existent affair and non-existence does not abide through wujud. For the demonstrations nullify this, but limits and manliness are intelligible and there is no cause that is not an effect. In that passage, Ibn Arabi explores the concept of causality and its implications for understanding God. He begins by stating that if God were a cause, the effect would be inseparable from him in wujud, meaning that they would be coextensive or identical. However, Ibn Arabi asserts that the effect is posterior to God, indicating a temporal and hierarchical distinction between them. The terms prior and posterior are affirmed to describe this relationship. Furthermore, Ibn Arabi argues that if God demanded the existence of the cosmos solely because of his essence, then none of the newly arrived things in the cosmos would be posterior to him. This suggests that the cosmos, as a result of God's demand, would not have any subsequent or dependent elements. Ibn Arabi criticizes the notion that nothing proceeds from God except one as it would invalidate relations and witnesses. Those who attribute relations to the procedure, despite its unity, are affirming relationships and properties. He emphasizes that 
the procedure itself is a non-existent, but the relations attributed to it are non-existent. Non-existence cannot endure through wujud as demonstrated by logical arguments. However, Ibn Arabi acknowledges that limits and multiplicity are intelligible concepts within our understanding, and there is no cause that is not also an effect. This suggests that causality exists within the realm of creation, where causes give rise to effects, and effects in turn become causes. Overall, Ibn Arabi challenges the idea of God being considered a conventional cause and highlights the complexity and subtlety surrounding the relationship among God, causality, and the cosmos. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.